Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Does it sound like I'm coming over the speaker system? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a very anxious crowd of people. <laughs> you have never calmed down this quickly, this soon. So I don't think there's anyone in the room I don't know, or I would introduce myself, but, I, I, but I'm Virtue Green, and tonight I am the president of the National Maritime Historical Society. And by the time we meet again, I, that probably won't be true. Uh, I've been with you for 27 wonderful, exciting, adventurous years. And uh, we are just looking now with the, uh, for the new president, executive director, and I think that they are within weeks of choosing someone, and then probably I'll stay on while that person gets acclimated. But um, I got to tell you, this has just been a fabulous adventure that you all provided for me. And at our annual meeting in Staten Island. The trustees gave me this beautiful gold um, uh, 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 compass rose with an actual working compass under it. So, um, but what I have the pleasure of doing tonight, before we have the speaker, is introducing our now chairman emeritus and for many, many years now, you have had him as our chairman. On January 1st, he stepped down and uh, is now uh, our chairman in charge of an education program. So he's going to be very active with us because, as you all know, it's been his dedication to make sure that we take our message to younger generations, that we do see history uh, for kids in the magazine, that we, uh, we are now in 25 of the 50 states giving pri maritime prizes for kids who, who participate in, in the National History Day competition. And uh, he has gone on as a global ambassador around the world uh, for us and has been just a very dedicated head. So for all of his efforts as a dedicated head, we present him tonight with his own bubblehead dog. <laughs> So, Ron, Oswald, 
Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> you recognize them. <laughs> Just like um, I will hold this for you while you while you do don't be shocked if you get reelected. <laughs> uh, not only will I not be shocked, but what is it? If you nominate me, I will not accept. If you both, what I had yeah, it, I will not serve. No, General Sherman's line. You, right. you can't use Sherman's line. <laughs> yeah, this this bottle I doll was mentioned when we were on Staten Island. But, uh, I thought you were kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she had to order a thousand of them. <laughs> yeah, the head stays upright no matter which the ship does. Well, thank you very much. My uh, pleasure this evening to uh, uh, welcome everybody here for the first time in quite a few months. And uh, it's good to get back together again in person so we can talk with each other, see what's going on, get ideas, so on and so forth. And uh, I've been interested in having Dan come and speak to us for a while now. Uh, I'm not sure how I heard about his organization, um, but I've attended a couple of their symposiums that they run every year and even though I've never been a diver I've never tried it but it was just fascinating the kind of work that they're doing so uh, Dan is one of the founding members of the New Jersey Historical Divers Association he's also currently the president and the main uh, activity of the, the association is to identify as many wrecks off the Jersey coast and uh, one of the interesting things you'll probably hear about there is that um, in my words not, not, not all wrecks are ships hmm. But, and there's a couple people here that, that catch the uh, mm -hmm. meaning behind that. But um, <coughs> just to mention a few other things, the uh, um, association has also established in New Jersey Shipwreck Museum. And it's located in Wall, New Jersey. Uh, we'll probably see a bit more about that during the course of the presentation. Um, Dan has a background as a technical illustrator and so reports that he's worked on with regard to identifying particular wrecks uh, will include detailed drawings of the plan of the site, what it looks like, photographs, measurements, so on and so forth. A uh, real scientific approach to figuring out, okay, we know there's a wreck down there. Who is it? How did it get there? So on and so forth. Um, and they publish, the association publishes a journal, I guess, sort of. Oh, once a year. Once a year. Yeah. With um, uh, some of the detailed reports, for example, that Dan is, has produced. Uh, the most recent issue that I got, uh, unfortunately, had to tell a story of two other longtime members who had recently passed away. So it was somewhat of a celebration of, of the activities and uh, what these people have contributed. The um, Shipwreck Museum got started in 2006, I think I read this correctly. And um, it's a volunteer effort, as I understand it. We'll, uh, we'll get to see some more about it, but why don't you want to try to, if you're ever thinking about where else can I go to see something maritime, here's a good place to start. So, um, 
with that, I'll get out of here. I'll take my bottle of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, man, it's good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, NJHDA, as Ron had said, started. We actually started in 1992 when a group of us got together to identify an enigmatic wreck off the beach at Manasquan. And consequently, it was called the Manasquan wreck. But it was also called the barrel wreck, the wickle wreck, the hardware wreck. Because anything you could find on it, you could find in a hardware store. And that's actually what led us to an identification of this vessel. We were actually able to get some of the brand names off of these items. And then we were able to do our research and identify the wreck. And with that, we said, you know, you know we're, we're all lay people. We're, none of us have a degree, certainly not in archaeology or history. What could we do? Are there other wrecks out there we could apply this process to or modify the process and see what we could do? And since 1992, the organization has identified 14 shipwrecks, 13 of which we've published on, one we're holding off on uh, for uh, publication value. We'll see what happens in the near future <laughs> back. And just regarding the museum, <clears throat> we opened April 1st, 2006, in a room that was like, 16 by 12. Now our entire museum, library, research, wet lab, dry lab, and display space is probably not as big as this room. But we are moving into a building that is 10 times the size of this room, about the size of a school gymnasium. And with a space like that, we're going to be able to show off some of our more size intensive artifacts. So that'll be a lot of fun. But let's get started. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to talk to you this evening uh, about New Jersey shipwrecks. And it's going to cover approximately a 15 year period. And I noticed there's a fellow over here with a camera. And I just want to say, I'm the cameraman's worst enemy. I am a moving target. I'm going to be over here. I'm going to be over there. So. What we'll do is, this This will just give you a good idea of what's off New Jersey and consequently, what's off New York. If you include Long Island, the Long Island shore and the New Jersey coastline, that area constitutes an area called the New York Bay. Now, just in New Jersey waters, by show of hands, don't bark out an answer, by show of hands, how many vessels have sank in New Jersey? How many vessels have wrecked? I'll use the term wrecked. How many vessels have wrecked in New Jersey waters? By show of hands, does anyone have a guess? No one. 50. 50. 200. 200. Anyone else? 1,000. 3,200 <laughs> documented accounts. It could be in the Arthur Kill, it could be in the Delaware River, it could be in the Atlantic Ocean. In the New York Bay, from Montauk to Cape May, well over 7,000 shipwreck incidences have occurred. Not all of them leave a permanent mark on the bottom. Several of them were just fender vendors, or one of them might have burned at a dock in Newark, in Port Newark. It doesn't mean they all occurred in the ocean. Not all vessels that wrecked were total wrecks. Some of them were salvaged and put back into service or glued together. <coughs> of all the vessels off New Jersey that leave a permanent mark on the bottom, the, it's probably closer to about 2,000 shipwrecks and easily half of them are unidentified. If there were six organizations like NJHDA, all working to identify unidentified wrecks off the coast of New Jersey, we would probably all have 20, 25 years work in front of us. It's just, it's a tremendous amount of uh, wreck out there, a tremendous amount of vessels wrecked. So why are they wrecking? Why so many wrecks in this area? This is the New York bite. This is Long Island and the Jersey Shore. You've got three major shipping lanes converging on a strip of water that's really only about seven miles from Rockaway to Sandy Hook. 
You've got traffic coming over from Europe. You've got traffic coming up from South America and the coasting states. You've got traffic coming around the Cape uh, from the Indian Ocean, all converging in this area. And they all converge in a very, very narrow channel, only about half mile wide, Ambrose Channel. There's also a smaller channel here that several party boats and some naval vessels use. But this is the Ambrose Channel. This is the main, uh, the main roadway into the port of New York. And with all this traffic coming in and out, it's a busy intersection and accidents are bound to happen. What's wrecked off our coast? Anything from small boats, tugboats, we've had military vessels out there, we've got tankers, we even have a submarine from World War II wrecked off our coast. And why did they wreck? For a variety of reasons. They catch fire, they get stranded, they're involved in a collision, some due to enemy action during a world war. There's all sorts of reasons why they wreck off our coast. So this is a diagram, this is mid-century, mid, uh, like mid-1800s, I think around 1846, if I'm not mistaken. This is the Cornelius Grinnell coming ashore at Squan Beach. The artist has depicted Squan Beach as a bluff, but this is an idea, this gives you a good idea of what it would look like when a wreck driven ashore due to high winds hits a bar and basically just gets pounded to pieces. In order to prevent shipwrecks from happening, people, you know, you've heard about the Pharaoh's lighthouse in uh, ancient Egypt. People have been building lighthouses or beacons or putting out buoys so that ships, vessels can avoid dangerous areas or find their way in and out of a port. This is the oldest operating lighthouse in the United States, the lighthouse at Sandy Hook. This is a, a lighthouse that was raised, the funding was raised uh, through lottery dollars. Businessmen in the early 1700s that were in the Port of New York decided, you know what, we gotta get our boats in and out safely. Let's have a lottery, let's build a lighthouse. Now the thing about lighthouses is they're great during the daytime. During the daytime they could be octagonal shaped towers, they could be cylindrical shaped towers, they could be red on the top and white on the bottom. This one's all painted white. It's got a red cap on it. You can easily see what the lighthouse looks like, even from miles away. And at night, this lighthouse could have a unique flashing pattern. Maybe three one-second flashes separated by a second, then two-second and a four-second burst, something like that. If you're traveling in this area around the 1800s, on, you're going to have a table with you, a tabular, and it's going to describe visually what the lighthouses look like during the day and what their flashing pattern is at night, so you can tell where you are. You're coming over from Europe, you see a distinctive looking lighthouse, you look at the chart, yeah, I'm pretty close, that looks like Barnegat Light to me. i got to hang a right, I'm going to go into the port of New York. The problem is, during a hurricane, during a fog, during a nor'easter, and these are useless. You can't see them during the day because of the storm. You can't see their flashing patterns at night because of the storm, right? You're really dead reckoning, and that's when a lot of shipwrecks occur. This is the Laura Bridgman ashore at Asbury Park in 1883. She came quite up onto the beach. She's completely gone to pieces. Here's a nice, great summer day. People, tourists are all over it, just hanging out all over the wreck. Now, this is a wreck that I cannot scuba dive on. I cannot dive on this wreck. It was carted away long ago, just broken up, and people would probably build mantles out of it or, or whatever. But it was it definitely salvaged and cut up and taken away. Here's another example of a wreck that was carted away. For years, one of my associates, Jack Fulmer, said, I'm looking for the Augustina. I'm looking for the Augustina. It sank somewhere off of Seabright. I'm gonna find it, we gotta find it. And I came across this picture of the Augustina, showed it to Jack, went right out of his sails, and he said, well, that's it. I guess I can give up looking for the Augustina. The boat looks in great shape for here, except that the hull goes up and then dips down. Her back is broken. It looks like she was apparently carrying a lot of uh, cord wood strewn all over the beach. They've got it all taken off the vessel and the vessel at this point is probably going to get cut up for scrap 
and cart it away. This is another example of a vessel, a wreck. It came ashore and was later hauled off and put back into service and served out the rest of her life, the La Amerique. And you can see how high and dry she is on the sandbar off of Seabright. That's her waterline right there. So she came ashore, came ashore during a big storm and later was hauled off and put back into service during a corresponding high tide. But these all count as wrecks. So far, nothing's under the water yet, right? These are all things that were either carted off or refloated. So this gives you an idea of what's going on off our shore. But now we can talk about vessels that wreck and leave a mark on the bottom. This is the John Mentrin, which wrecked in 1846, February of 1846. It was such a hellacious storm, 10 vessels wrecked off the New Jersey coast that day, including the Minturn. That doesn't include <clears throat> what wrecked off of Delmarva, what wrecked off of Long Island, what wrecked off of Montauk, all right? It was just a tremendous amount of, of wrecking uh, going on during that storm. But the Minturn had the highest loss of life at about 51 souls lost and they named the storm after her, the Minturn Storm. Uh, there are, this wreck has not been positively identified, but associate, associates of mine believe they have dived on this wreck. It's not too far off the beach, maybe a couple of hundred yards off the Squan Beach area. But look at what's down her side. This is a Courier Knives depiction, by the way. Look at what's down her side. By show of hands, again, don't be allowed an answer. By show of hands, what are those? False gun ports. False gun ports. Same thing. False Same gun. thing. You want your hand up? Just painted on false gun ports. That's exactly correct. <laughs> this is the age of piracy still. We're in piracy today. Right? You look at, you know, Somali pirates firing rocket propelled grenades at cruise ship. I'm sure when the first person put a log in the water, somebody was behind him with a rock and clocked him and took over his log. <laughs> So these are, indeed, painted black square. She didn't have a gun on her. At least nothing that was in a gun port that we know of. We suspect there was at least one gun on board, though. Um, this is not the last time you're going to see this. You'll see this, uh, these black squares on other vessels. One of the most horrific, one of the most tragic wreckings that we ever had off the Jersey Shore was on November 13th of 1854, that of the New Era, which came ashore at Asbury Park with a loss of somewhere in the area of 295 people. 50 people died of cholera on the way over, coming over from Germany to the port of New York. Four or five people died when a rogue wave came over the side and knocked the uh, cookhouse overboard. And then, during a heavy fog and a terrific storm, she was headed for the Jersey Shore. A lot of people, when they look at this contemporary image, say, something's wrong about it. It's not right. Not right. And they criticize the artist as depicting this incorrectly. Actually, it is extremely accurate. According to the captain, when he struck the bar, head facing south, he set all yards aback. That means he turned all of his sails around and had them facing the back of the boat rather than the front of the boat. And his top sails were clued. And there they are, all clued up, all gathered up. He was trying to blow his boat back off the reef, back off the sandbar. We believe she's still there today. Uh, another vessel, we believe, passed right over these remains when she wrecked in 1934, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. So in order to avoid, <clears throat> in order to avoid wrecks from happening, you use navigational aids. But when a wreck does occur, you want to have somebody go out there and help save people. And that's when the United States Life Saving Service got started originally as a volunteer organization in the mid-1800s, but in 1871, it officiated as a government agency and became the United States Life Saving Service. It was established, all original eight stations were established in then Monmouth County. Monmouth County at that point was Monmouth and Ocean County, but it was big enough to house the original eight stations. 
This would later become a Coast Guard station or an auxiliary station for the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard uh, would uh, be formed by the United States Lifesaving Service, an agency that went into action when a wreck occurred, along with the Revenue Cutter Service in 1916. That service made sure boats got in and out of ports so that taxes and tariffs could be collected. And thus the United States Coast Guard was born, 1916. So it's very fair to say that the United States Coast Guard started in Monmouth County, New Jersey. I happen to live in Monmouth County. <laughs> That's a view from the tower of that building. That was the uh, station number two at Sperm City Cove in, uh, at Sandy Hook. And you could easily see down to the next station, maybe about four miles away. And on a clear day, that's a great view. But on a foggy night or a stormy night, you had to go out there and actually patrol the beach. And if a wreck did occur, you would signal the wreck, usually with a flare, to let them know that help was on the way. And help would be in the form of a small lyle gun or a small cannon that would fire out a projectile out to the vessel in distress and on it would be instructions at the end of the line with the projectile would be bored about that day and on one side maybe in english on the other side maybe in german would be instructions as to what to do with the line which is to haul it in there's a bigger line at the end of it with block and tackle on it you hook it up to your boat we pull it tight and we shuttle people back and forth along that line if we can't get a boat out to you this assumes of course that the wreck is maybe up to a thousand feet offshore but what if, what if you got a Spanish-speaking crew on board, and they can't understand what's what does the board mean? What do we do with this rope? So that's when lifesavers, despite the fact that it's too rough to go out by boat, would go out by boat anyhow and try to set matters right on the boat on the wrecking vessel. And that's where most lifesavers lost their lives. This is a couple examples of the Lyle guns uh, that were used on wrecks off New Jersey. They are on, one of them is on display at the Twin Lights Museum in Highlands, New Jersey. This is the Antioch, a three-masted vessel, only two appear here, right? A three-masted vessel that came ashore at Manasquan, at the very, very north end of Manasquan. You can see the vessel's in pretty sad shape. You've got lifesavers over here and a lifeboat over here moving cargo and people off. Here's another image. The vessel is turned around <coughs> when the photo is flipped. We're not really sure, but here are the lifesavers from the foreground working with the wreck in the background, and you've got some spectators on the beach. What I think is particularly interesting, though, is this woman over here. A lot of people say she's kind of fat, right? Kind of rotundous. She's not, actually. She's probably built like this woman over here. If you look at the way she's standing, she's standing like this. And what's apparently happened is the wind has caught under her outfit and has inflated her garment. <laughs> so, identifying wrecks. What we do as an organization is we look at the wreck itself, how it's fabricated, its size, the proportion, the dimensions of the timbers that we can measure. We look at artifacts that we can recover, we look at insurance reports, newspaper articles, photographs, letters of correspondence, etc. And we try to match names with faces. And if we can, we're fortunate enough to identify a boat. How do you find them in the first place? We're interested in identifying wrecks, not necessarily spending months, years looking for them. Although we've done that on occasion, mostly what we're interested is in identifying wrecks that already exist that people dive or fish on but nobody knows their names. Names like the Logwood Wreck, the Northeast Sail, the 120. I mean, these are great little names, but what does it really mean? A lot of wrecks are discovered by boat captains that employ mechanized fishing practices, which means that around the 1920s, the 1930s, mechanized fishing practices came into being and people started discovering shipwrecks, dragging nets, dragging uh, clam rigs across the bottom, they started to encounter what was left. And very often, they would drag up anchors. This anchor was probably recovered in the 1920s and sits outside of a Point Pleasant uh, Beach restaurant. 
Nobody knows where it's from, though. Every now and then, you might be fortunate enough to recover a bell. This is a bell that is on display out in front of Klein's Seafood Restaurant from the Rebellion. That's the name on this bell. And if we dive and we find a name, that's great news because now we have a name, we can research it, we can find out what happened. But sometimes you don't really find much, just a bunch of wood laying on the bottom, just a bunch of wood swept up onto the beach. In the foreground is my wife. Uh, this is in 1992. <clears throat> my friends are in the background over here. This piece of wreckage is probably about five or six feet wide and about 20 feet long. It would probably fill this area here. And it was discovered on the beach at, Man at Maniloke shortly after, I think we called it the December storm of 92. <laughs> that's the beach. Right there, that's the beach. This is the beach undermined, so this was buried under sand for decades, maybe even a century. Nobody knew this chunk of wreckage was here. Just off the beach is a vessel called the Mantelokin Wreck, and it had that name for many years. But we were able to identify it as the ship Ellen Austin. And when we researched this vessel, we found out she was built around the 1850s, I think 54, and she was written up in all kinds of trade journals as being a fast packet, a fast ship for her day. And around 1880, she was sold to a German concern. And 1883, she gave up the ghost and rather unceremoniously hit a sandbar off of Maniloki and went to pieces. But we know the location, the general location of the wreck. This is an archeological site plan of what the wreck the wreckage looks like today. We've got the remains of a windlass up in the area that we believe is the bow. Originally, there was a cannon found on it. It now sits in our museum. There was a lot of ballast stone and barrels. Those barrels are all about this big, and they are cement, so cement barrels. What's interesting about them is the wood that held them has long rotted away, leaving a perfect cast, a perfect mold of the inside of the barrel, including the grain of the wood, which is spectacular. There's like 30, 36 of these barrels all over. So the president of the, of the organization at that time knew somebody that worked at the Kimberly Clark Laboratories up in uh, North Jersey. And we, we took off a piece of cement. We knew that the Meta was carrying Portland cement. So we had this little piece of cement that we chipped off of one of these barrels. We had it sent out to the Kimberly Clark Laboratory and they sent back a report stating that all of the components that make up this material are the ingredients of Portland cement. We're really happy identified it, we got the location, we got the cargo, this is perfect. And we thanked them, and they thanked us. And I, I said, well, uh, I'm thanking you because you did thousands of dollars worth of analysis for us for free. Why are you thanking us? And they said, well, it was really a change of pace from what we normally analyze in this laboratory. <laughs> and we said, well, what do you normally analyze? And they said, well, our biggest client is Huggies Diapers. <laughs> <laughs> Every now and then, if you can find it out, it would be great, right? I found on this wreck about two miles offshore, it went by several names. One of them was Ruth's Barge, because the captain, Captain Paul Hepler of the Venture 3, his wife, he named the wreck after her when they discovered it. And on it, I found a bell holder. You can see how big it is, about eight inches long or so. And the boat that we're on has a bell holder on it just about the same size. Now, this is a reproduction USN bell, but I figured, oh, if I could find this bell, I'm gonna be able to identify this wreck. So we started really scouring this wreck for anything that would identify it, but we didn't come up with much. So we decided there's gotta be another way of identifying this boat. So we're gonna do an archeological site plan. This site is over 200 feet long and over 100 feet wide and is made up of three major components, a flat bottom and two flat sides. And you all know what a hard chine is, right? It's where the sides come down. This boat apparently had a very hard chine to it. So we showed this plan 
to an archaeologist and he said this is a schooner barge or barge built by a schooner barge company. So okay, gives us a clue. So we started to look at everything that wrecked in that area of Long Branch and found three candidates. The William B. Gates, which was only rumored to have sunk in that area. The Progress, which was salvaged 10 days later and was floating in a port in New York City, in quarantine in fact, and the Plymouth, a barge built by a schooner barge company. Her sister ship, the Wicomico, is within 5% of the dimensions of the Plymouth, of what we call the bell holder wreck. So we're looking, we're figuring, okay, it looks like the bell holder is going to wind up being the Plymouth. It's very, very close in design to this vessel. Very straight sides and a very flat bottom. So flat, there's the beach. I mean, she's sitting there at low tide, and they're still working on the Wicomico building her before putting in her into service. And this is most likely what our vessel looked like. This is most likely what this wreck looked like when she was afloat. Six years later, Dave Raskowitz finds the bell. While I'm dying. I said to him, is there a name on the bell? And he said, there's no name. Your, identi your identity is safe. Your identification <laughs> is safe. So probably when the vessel was built in Elkton, Maryland, uh, the owner probably just threw on any bell that would meet Coast Guard regulation and didn't bother having it in Boston. But the location is correct for the Plymouth. As a matter of fact, when we reconstruct the Plymouth, when we reconstruct the bell holder wreck, looking at this plan, when we reconstruct it in 3D, it fits to within 2% of the specifications of the Plymouth. She had coal on board and she wrecked in the location, she's laying in the location the Plymouth wrecked in. So we've got location, we've got artifact and the vessel itself, and we've got cargo, coal. So we were successfully able to identify the bell holder wreck as the Plymouth. And this is probably what the Plymouth looked like when she was under tow by a tugboat carrying a couple of other barges. They got caught in a bad storm. Things started going haywire. One boat rammed into another or another one plowed up on the beach. And basically from testimony, the Plymouth sank, according to one witness, in almost an instant when a wave overwhelmed her. So this is a depiction of what the uh, Plymouth looked like when she was sinking. All hands got off, by the way, no deaths. Another vessel that we like to dive on is called the Cadet. And for years, divers in the 70s, the early 70s, late 60s, were following a lobsterman by the name of Kramer. And he would always go out to this wreck and come up with lobsters. So what they would do, you know, he track them. And what the divers did is they followed him up, got the location of the wreck, and they started diving on it. And one of the divers came up and said, you know, her stern is intact. It kind of looks like one of those sailors you train cadets on. So it was now, it went from Kramer's wreck to the cadet. And years later, we were able to identify it as the John H. Winstead. That is what the Winstead, that is what the cadet looked like when she was afloat, a schooner barge. Not exactly like a boxy barge, but still a towable vessel. <clears throat> this is what she looks like on the bottom today. The end indicates north. She still has basically her boat shape, fantail. She's, her sides are falling in and out. Her bow is falling over, and she has no chain on board. No anchor chain. Her chains go out to the north. She has no anchor chain on board. She was involved in a double wrecking. Three barges, this is I think in the 1927, three barges are progressing north. They're being hauled by a tug. One of them springs a leak and sinks almost immediately. The other two are ordered to put out their anchors. They're going to ride out the storm with the tug. The next morning, 12 hours later, the windstead springs a leak and settles by the stern and then settles on her keel on the bottom. The last vessel stays afloat and is pulled into the port of New York. Again, no deaths. So two vessels sink right near each other. 
This is a wreck called the String Wreck, and Captain George Hoffman used to like to take a reel and string the pieces together because you could always find two or three lobsters on each piece. It was well worth stringing them together, particularly in low visibility. I saw them one day in good visibility when basically from here, I could see about 100 feet all around me. Yes, the visibility in New Jersey does get pretty good from time to time. But what's interesting to note, she has her anchor chain on board. We know from historic records that the vessel sank about 1,000 feet apart. This is about 1,000 feet. There's the cadet with her chain out. There's the string with her chain on board. And from this, we were able to identify the Millville and the John H. Winstead as these two wrecks. Bear with me one moment. Another wreck that we were able to identify was the Cecilia M. Dunlap, which for years was called a tanker. A tanker off sea right, in about 60, 65 feet of water. The only largely intact area of the boat is her stern. But it didn't look like a barge. And you know, they didn't build barges out of metal, not schooner barges, they built them out of wood. We really weren't thinking that this was a barge per se. It actually looked more like a sailing vessel. And when we looked into this, when we looked a little further into this, we were able to find out that this is the Cecilia M. Dunlap, originally built as the Park Nook in 1876 in Whitehaven, England. And this is her stern with her rudder, which when we measure it, looks pretty much the same as what you see in the picture there. So we come to find out that the Dunlap was, the Park Nook was wrecked in the Virgin Islands. A company in, New, in uh, the New York area bought the wreckage, fixed her up, and turned her into a barge so that she could still be useful during World War I uh, when people were still using um, you know, metal for helmets and tanks and other vessels that they needed over in Europe. So around the 1930s, she finally springs a leak and sinks rather unceremoniously off of Sandy Hook and lay there undisturbed for many years. She was flattened uh, by dynamite charges, TNT charges. Uh, but what was interesting to note was that her stern was relatively intact. And right there, right on that plate of metal years ago, I found a copper box about that big with a brass ring in it, threaded ring. Whatever lid was in there was long gone. And inside was a waxy, ambery substance. It was kind of soft. And I really didn't know what it was, but I took a sample of it, gave it to my friend, who took it to his lab at the EPA and brought it to work, go to the guys in the lab and say, what is this? Where did you get it? He said, we got it from a shipwreck. They said, cool, we'll be right back. <laughs> they came back about an hour later, rather ashen looking, and they said, why didn't you tell us what it was? We didn't know what it was. That's why we gave it to you guys. What is it? They said it's a degraded form of trinitrotoluene, otherwise known as TNT. Oh and I was shipping away at this thing. <laughs> gave my mother all her gray hairs. Another vessel that we were able to identify was the Longwood Wreck. We thought that maybe this was a mistaken identity for a wreck nearby that we see big pieces of log on, a log laying around the bottom, like big timbers, like you know, the size of telephone poles, even bigger, two, three feet in diameter. But this is a little further away, a little further offshore in deeper water. We have a good location on it, but I didn't know what logwood was. And I started Googling and found out that logwood and another wood called Brazil wood are woods used in manufacturing dyes. It was very popular in the 16, 1700s. And people that like make their own soap today, well, people that are craftsmen, they'll make their own dyes. And there is still a market uh, for logwood. This is a piece that I had recovered. Now, it certainly didn't look like, you know, the end of a beam or a plank or anything like that. It looked more like a root. And in fact, that's what it is. It's the very bottom of the logwood tree. 
We also knew that when we did a little research, that a vessel uh, called the, Flo uh, the Florence Thurlow was carrying logwood in about the area our vessel wrecked, when our vessel was on the bottom, when she had wrecked years ago. But we also knew from photographic evidence that she was rigged with turnbuckles. Anybody not know what a turnbuckle is? Anybody not know what a dead eye is? All right, so you all know that stuff. So the turnbuckle is the more modern equivalent of the dead eye in ship's rigging. And we see on the bottom turnbuckles. This is the loop shape, the bolt out each end. And there's like eight or nine of these on the rack. We also, whoops, well, going to back up a little bit. So we also, we, we know from this that we've got artifacts that were on the Florence Thurlow, photographs of her match up. We've got, you know, a cargo of logwood, and she's right in the right location. As a matter of fact, she's within 1,200 feet of the historic location given years ago. So we've got three things working for us, artifact, cargo, and location. So we were able to identify the logwood as the Florence Thurlow. Along our shoreline, we've lost a lot of different vessels. Some of them have been salvaged and put back into service or carted away, as I mentioned earlier in the program, or leave a mark on the bottom today. Here's the county of Edinburgh, wrecked at Point Pleasant Beach, and there again are those painted black squares. And this is, this is 1900, right? This is, you figure, holy cow, you know, pirates still abound. We're trying to trick people into keeping far enough away that they think those are real gun ports. The wreck we first identified, the Manasquan wreck, as I told you earlier, is located just north of Manasquan Inlet, right off of Pompano. Pompano in uh, one of the side streets off First Avenue, about 900 feet off the beach. This is a diagram of what she looks like on the bottom today. That's offshore, inshore, if I got that right. Her frames and planks and a lot of concreted iron product, including bales of wire. Those bales are probably about three, four feet in diameter. Probably barbed wire or something like that. Maybe wire that would be used later in the production of nails. But we also found tons of artifacts on board, including patent locks. These are iron product with a brass dust plate with the word patent on them. And we were able to date these artifacts to around the first half of the 1900s. We were, uh, first half of the 1800s. We were also able to collect a lot of pewter spoons. This pattern is still available today, if you look around. All of these spoons have marked on the backside T. Hill, Thomas Hill, who was manufacturing for the United States market in the early 1800s. We also found on board, whoops, we also found on board spear files, you know, like when you want to file off a nail or something like that, and a lot of other products. Of the 12 artifacts that we recovered, nine of them had manufacturer's names on them. We were able to determine when each of those products went in and out of their manufacturer's catalogs. And when we took that bar chart, that horizontal bar chart, and lined up all those dates, we came up with a three-year span, 1821 to 1823, when they were all in common. And just outside of that, 1824, when the warehouses are still full of this product, was the wreck of the Amity, April 24th, 1824, off the beach at Manasquan. So the Manasquan wreck now is called the Amity. This is the, it says Bark Adonis, it really should be Ship Adonis, wrecking at Long Branch in 1859. She's got on board in her hull, she's got 124 millstones and 550, 115 pound lead ingots. It's a heavy load. 18 years later comes the steamer rustling. She's making for the same port. She's caught in the same kind of storm. She's headed for the same beach. She narrowly misses the beach at Long Branch, but she rips open her bottom on the remains of the Adonis sank 18 years before. 
and now the two wrecks are forever entombed in the sands off Long Branch. They call them, we've, we've called them the dual wrecks, the Takanasi wrecks, because of Lake Takanasi right over here, the Long Branch wrecks, the twin wrecks. Now they are the Adonis and the Rustlin. This is the Rustlin shortly after wrecking. And here you can see years later, she's being slowly scrapped. Now, mostly what remains is just the bottom and this section flattened down. This is what they look like on the bottom today. Much of the millstones and lead ingots have been recovered, but you can see some of the millstones are still arranged in the hull, like Oreo cookies in a cookie tray. A couple of them laying around. The shaft of the rustling, her broken propeller blades are scattered about because she chopped them all off when she struck the remains of the Adonis. Her engine, boilers, condensers, and her sides strewn out around the bottom. This is maybe 18, 20 feet of water here, maybe 25 feet of water there. Because of the angle of the beach, maybe 20 feet up there. She only lays about maybe 200 yards off the beach. This is one of those uh, ingots that came up. And one of the millstones, a small millstone, uh, it's only about three feet in diameter, that sits in our museum today. I don't know where the, mills, uh, the uh, ingot is. I'd love to get a hold of it, just to have it on display for a little while. This is a bronze valve in the closed position. This was a, a pipe that came off of this. This is the first artifact I ever recovered. I think I recovered it in 1977. I was living at home with my folks. And my dad looks at me and he says, you know, Mel Fisher, he finds diamonds and gold. You bring me broken plumbing. <laughs> I love it. It's on display in the museum. The Western World off of Spring Lake. This is basically what she looks like today. The arrow at the top indicates north. She's basically contiguous as far as her keel is concerned, but often she sands in in the middle. And she was carrying a lot of iron product, so those two lumps, the one in the lower left and upper right, are basically congealed cargo items, much of it iron product. But she did carry powder flasks, not powder horns, powder flasks. You could actually adjust the amount of gunpowder you put down the muzzle of your muzzle-loading weapon. Right? This is modern times, 1848, I believe. This is the Lizzie H. Brayton coming ashore at Point Pleasant Beach in 1904. This gives you an idea of where she is off of Elizabeth. Morrison Avenue, maybe 15 feet deep. The IRL indicates north. These horizontal lines are actually deck beams. She was a two-deck vessel, her main deck and one deck below before getting to her keel, which was uh, constituted of a, a centerboard. She was a centerboard schooner. And the fact she's in 15 feet of water and these beams, deck beams are here, almost flat to the bottom, means she's got like another six, seven feet to go before you get to her keel. When you fan the sand, she is still loaded with coal. This is the Pliny, ashore in 1882 off the Deal Casino. You can see right here, her back is broken. She's on the bar and she will stay there. That's what she looks like behind the Phillips Avenue Pavilion and the Deal Casino in Deal, New Jersey. This is one of those very long uh, jetties opposite the Deal Casino. Her bow is embedded in that. I have a diagram here that'll better explain it. If you are snorkeling or fishing around the jetty behind the Deal Casino, if you favor the north side, you'll turn around and find some iron products sticking up out of the jetty. Make a hard left and go north and you will come across her boiler and condenser her engine, flywheel, propeller shaft, and propeller and rudder at the end. This flywheel is probably eight feet in diameter. Without a scuba tank, just snorkeling, I can swim through the spokes of that flywheel. At low tide, I'm six five. at low tide, I can stand on that flywheel and be this high out of the water. That's how shallow a wreck that is. Great fishing wreck too. Deeper shipwrecks. We have the Cornelius Hargraves 
which is infamous because she sank a steamer. She sank an iron hulled steamer. She also sunk herself, by the way. This was off New Jersey in 1890. She sunk a vessel that we nicknamed for many years the Spanish Wreck, because for some reason nobody could pronounce Vizcaya. Right, but we called it the Spanish Wreck because we knew it had a Spanish sounding name. I believe Vizcaya is the name of a port city in South America, if I'm not mistaken. So she's carrying a lot of coal. The Vizcaya is carrying cargo and passengers. There were deaths involved. We found a number of artifacts. Jay Jessup, a friend of mine, found a lot of artifacts in one small concentrated area. He found a perfume atomizer, a whistle. He found a piece of tile, which he swore when he first saw it looked like a wing, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. He also found a few other things, including a garment that looked kind of like a sundress or a nightgown, but it was all black. And it was probably black because of the products of corrosion from rust nearby, from iron rusting nearby, like her hull. But with the powder, puff and a comb, perfume atomizer, this outfit, he was sure he found somebody's luggage. So he goes digging around, and as he's digging, he finds a couple of small bones, uh, bones about the size of chicken wing bones, and that's exactly what he thought they were. And since cooking food can be a form of preservation, he probably found something that drifted in there. So he took the bones home. And he had a regular medical exam, as many of us do. And he brought the bones with him to his doctor, and he said, Doc, what are these things? And he said, his doctor said, those are finger bones. As a matter of fact, those are the finger bones of a child. So he went through the list of people that died on the wreck and found that a young girl had died on the wreck, about eight years old. And he realized he found her. So we felt really bad, got very depressed, and said to his friends, I really want to go back. I want to put the bones back. And they said, Jay, whatever you want to do, let's go. So they get to the spot, they dig a hole, and they place the two bones at the bottom of the hole. And Jay's looking at it, and shifting sands in the ocean, right? The hole starts to collapse, and as it collapses, this piece of tile came out, and to his sensibilities on the bottom to his state of mind he swore that that looked like an angel because not only did that come out of the sand two gold coins came out of the sand so he took the child took the coins left the bones came up <laughs> and that's jay's story about his find on the other sky this is the delaware very very well dived wreck off our coast uh, some people call it the money wreck because it's so close to shore that even on bad days, you might be able to get out there and get a, a few divers in the water and collect a fare for it. People also say that it might have had a lot of money on board because there is a book that claims a loss of a quarter of a million dollars. Actually, what it is, is it's a confused number. 125000 was the insurance value of the boat. 125000 was her cargo. That's where the quarter million comes from. There is no, uh, there is no gold or, or anything of great value on the Delaware. Recently, a bell came up. The bell is located right in this area up here by the tank. And uh, that was on exhibit uh, during our last symposium, the uh, shipwreck symposium that we had last May. This is the engine of the Delaware. The engine stands taller than this room. It's probably about six or seven feet and then stands about 15 feet off the bottom. For any of you steam engine buffs, this is her steam chest with the uh, valve, the slide mechanism that would introduce steam at both ends of the two cylinder engine. And then from there, it connects to the propeller shaft and goes to the back of the boat. What I think is very interesting about this photograph, it's a very nice day, very clear day, right? In the tropics, we dive in an azure blue world. In New Jersey, we dive in an emerald world. We've got, uh, uh, I, I wanna say this is a female blackfish. We've got bergals, 
we've got sea bass, and we've got a trigger fish. And a trigger fish is a tropical fish. So it's interesting to note that tropical fish do come into New Jersey waters. We lost vessels during World War I, including the San Saba. <coughs> San Saba, which struck a mine uh, laid by a U-boat off our coast, outside of the uh, Barnegat area. She lays on the bottom today in two pieces, her bow separated from her stern by about 75 feet. Good divers with good navigation skills, uh, strong divers rather with good navigation skills can navigate between the two on a single dive and not run too low on air. The RC Mohawk, the revenue cutter Mohawk, I mentioned the revenue cutter service before, she sank after a collision with a vessel while on patrol outside of Sandy Hook, outside of the port of New York, looking for U-boats during World War I. Take a look at her bow. Kind of forward swept, like undercut, and a bit of embellishment on the front. This is part of like, I think this is one of the remains of Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet, or a vessel that immediately succeed, uh, succeeded that fleet. This is the heavy cruiser San Diego. Again, forward swept bow, and the ornate design on her bow. She was, I believe, black stacks, buff, and white. She sank after striking a mine laid by a U-boat off of Long Island, and is a very, very popular Long Island wreck. Mm -hmm. Now, with all these U-boats during World War I cruising off our shores, causing all sorts of havoc, we knew we needed fast attack vessels, and we started to design a fleet of sub-chasers. This is sub-chaser number 60, which sank off New Jersey during World War I. Notice the design, though. You know, we were talking about those forward swept looking bows before, the ornate decorations up there. Nope, we got more of something that really is more closely resembling, resembling a PT boat of World War II. So we're starting to change the design. Early World War I, later World War I. We're starting to look at more modern-looking vessels. In between World War I and World War II, we had some notable uh, uh, incidences involving the same architect. This is the Sylvanus, a vessel that NJHDA identified off of Seabrake. We did a lot of work off North Jersey, surprisingly, more than I thought we would. This, does anybody by show of hands have an idea of the construction material of this vessel? Anyone by show of hands? You're telling us. Huh? You're telling us. I'm telling you? This is, well, that's right. Uh, I didn't even see that. <laughs> well, it shows I don't read my slides, right? <laughs> this is a wooden hulled vessel. It looks like a metal hulled vessel. As a matter of fact, there was a contest held by the United States government during World War I where we wanted to make sure that a lot of iron product got put to the war use. So we said, you know what, we gotta build vessels out of alternate materials. And we experimented with concrete vessels. It was actually a fleet of cement vessels. They floated rather well. And if they get a hold of them, you just draw cement in there and it cures. But this is a wooden vessel meant to, to fulfill the function of a steel vessel of the day. Many of these were built, many of these were put into service. Some were actually uh, commandeered on the ways and turned into barges uh, because the war ended too soon for them to all be put into service, including the Savannahs. But this is what she would have looked like if she was completed. As far as we know, the Savannahs in particular was only uh, completed to that point. Uh, to that point. Do and we know what kind of wood? What kind? No, I don't. Um, Wait a minute, maybe I do. Well, she would have had pine decks, and she would have probably had oak frames. Probably she would have been oak planks over oak frame. That would be my guess with uh, pine decks. Because pine, you don't have to worry about it. You're going to chop it up. You're going to dump coal on it or manure or whatever other kind of bolt carter you're going to have. You don't care so much about the deck as you do about the hull. Theodore Ferris was the 
naval architect that won this contest. There were several architects that competed for the government contract to design and then later have built these wooden vessels, Theodore Ferris. Theodore Ferris uh, also designed that boat, the Morrow Castle. And he pretty much went to his grave thinking that it was a poor design on his part that led to this disaster. Actually, his design had really nothing to do with it. It was what they did with it afterwards. This is, even though it was just after Prohibition had ended, we're still in the Depression. We're in the 1930s. In order to get more people on the boat, first-class cabins were divided with plywood walls, illegal. They were painted with non-fire retardant paint, illegal. She also passed all of her Coast Guard inspections. The Morrow Castle disaster is a comedy of errors. It is the perfect embodiment of Murphy's Law. If anything can go wrong, it will, and at the worst possible moment. This is her ashore at Asbury Park, and she is likely sitting on the remains of the new era. Not the last time, right, that a vessel, not the first time a vessel would be on top of another, separated by years. Because of the Morrow Castle disaster, the Mohawk would be drafted into service and take up the Morrow Castle's lucrative Havana, New York to Havana run. She gets into trouble. Let's see, the Morrow Castle wrecks September 8th, 1934, it's Labor Day weekend, January, we've got the sister ship of the Morrow Castle, the Mohawk, cruising out of New York, going to Havana, she gets in trouble with her navigation and steering, and has time for a vessel that left eight hours after she did to catch up, ram her, and put her on the bottom. We're still investigating the Morrow Castle when this occurs. The Morrow Castle and the Mohawk are all on by the same three lines. The ward, let's see, let's see if I can get this right. The ward line, the Clyde line, and one more line, Mallory line. The Coast Guard did a report. When they finally did the report on the Morrow Castle, it actually read the Morrow Castle and Mohawk disasters, an investigation into these two wrecks. How could three lines lose two vessels in one year? Right? It was a disaster. Pretty much spelled the end of those lines, if I'm not mistaken. This is what the Mohawk looks like today. Just the major components are down there. The major hull pieces, the major uh, frames uh, that would hold up the main deck. Pretty much everything else is gone. What does remain are her, uh, her turbine engine, her boilers are still down there, and some of her heavy duty deck equipment. This is uh, one of the residents cruising by. This is a mola, otherwise known as an ocean sunfish. It is approximately the size of the screen you are looking at. Completely inedible fish. It's, it's a, a really, it's a beautiful fish to watch swim around, but you really can't do much with it if you catch it. But it is a cool looking fish. We lost a number of vessels during World War uh, II. Because of the Mohawk and Morrow Castle disaster, Franklin, Franklin signed, President Franklin signed into, Roosevelt rather, signed into being sweeping changes in the way vessels would be built. And we would start building vessels with double hulls. Uh, but, you know, again, this is like the World Trade Center. You build it to withstand a wind. You don't build it to withstand somebody intentionally trying to bring the building down. But this was built by some pretty modern standards, even by today's standards. But, again, who expects that somebody wants to attack it? During World War II, the vessel is struck by a uh, enemy uh, vessel's torpedo. Her back is broken. She's got so much oil on board, she takes days to sink. She burns for days off New Jersey. And in 1942, with all the smoke on the horizon, government officials could no longer deny that World War II had reached the United States, and in particular, New Jersey. This is another shot of her sinking. I want you to take a look at her stern in the lower portion of the photo. That's a four-inch deck gun on a raised platform. 
and it would take a crew of about four Navy men to operate it. So not only now is she a viable commercial target, she's a viable military target. Another shot of her sinking, perfect silhouette of that gun on her stern. She sinks. This is the Loda, which is later uh, named the Tolton. She uh, doesn't have any cargo on board in that picture, obviously. Look at how high her waterline is. It's amazing she doesn't topple over. This is when she's later named uh, the Tolton, but she still has the name Loda on the side. She's also got the word Chile on the side. In World War II, Chile was neutral. During the daytime, they painted Chile on the side so that German U-boats would not sink them. At night, they kept lights on their flags so that they were visible to U-boats at night and they knew, hey, I'm a Chilean vessel, don't sink me. While this vessel, while the Tolton was moving from southern waters towards the port of New York, a patrol boat out of Baltimore came by and said, Captain, turn out your lights. The captain said, if I do that, I'm going to get some. The patrol boat said, you're in the United States waters, you've got to turn out your lights. He did so, and by the time he got opposite Barnegat, the U-boat had surfaced and put a torpedo right amidship, hit the radio shack, wiped out the executive staff. Everybody on board the boat died except for one, one sole survivor, Julio Faust, who uh, was found hours later clinging to a piece of floating wreckage, the only survivor of the Tolton sinking. This is a drawing that I did of her bow years ago, probably uh, still in the 90s, uh, when her bow was more or less intact, although shorn off of the rest of the vessel. Today, this is all a skeletal framework. Not, not only has her hull plates rusted and fallen in, her deck is long gone. This is the Arundo, which was sunk in April of 1942, about 16, 17 miles off of Asbury Park. She carried in her hull, you see we're still in Africa at this point during World War II, she carried in her hull engine differentials and chassis and engine parts to 127 two and a half ton trucks. She also carried as deck cargo a couple of uh, two and a half ton trucks and two locomotives with the tender cars. Again, look at the gun on the back. She's also armed with machine guns and uh, smaller guns as well. So she's pretty much armed to the teeth. She's not only a commercial target, a military target. There's a tragedy that happens. When off of the Asbury Park, a torpedo strikes under the bridge and wipes out the executive staff. Survivors of the disaster are now getting into these lifeboats and lowering them over and getting away from the bow, which is now sinking. These two locomotives topple off and land on one of those lifeboats. Mm. Only about a third of the people that were on board the Arundo survived that sinking. This is the Persephone, another victim of an enemy attack during World War II. This is her sinking, still buoyed up by the oil in her hull. Look at that sheen. There's another great view of an oil spill, right? We had around six or seven of these kind of incidences off the New Jersey coast during World War II. I'm 65, when I was a boy, and I would go to the beach at Sandy Hook, I would see these little egg yolk sized tar balls all over the beach. Those are the remains of oil from wrecks during World War II, sunk off our coast due to enemy action. That oil is pretty much dispersed today, but they were all over the beach. It wasn't uncommon to find them. In recent years, we lost the lightship relief around 1960. If you're familiar with the Port of New York, you've all heard about the Ambrose Lightship, which was our lightship out at sea. Well, it's a boat, right? You've got to bring it into port and clean it now and then, along with all the other uh, light ships around the United States. So the relief would go and stand on station while the permanent boat was brought in, 
whole scrape, give it a paint job, bring it back out, the relief would go on to its next assignment. The relief was involved in a collision with a vessel that sank her. So it was decided soon after that that we would build a permanent tower out there, a four-legged tower with like an air traffic control light tower above that on a flat deck. Well, years later, a boat comes along and knocks off one of those legs. So we decided we would build a single spire mounted into the bottom. Somebody did that too. So finally it was decided to build an anchored buoy that would simply move out of the way if somebody actually bumped into it. And that's what's there today. But we also lost uh, Texas Tower number four, one of, I believe, a total of five early warning uh, radar systems that were going to be deployed off our coast. Only two of them were built, one on bedrock off Cape Cod and one on a sandy shoal off New Jersey. Because it was on a sandy shoal, it immediately earned the nickname Old Shaky. It was way too top heavy. Hurricanes Donna and Daisy severely weakened her and they decided, well, what we need to do with these 12 foot diameter legs is pour, is dump bags of concrete down in them to try to reinforce them. So they flew out tons and tons of bags of cement to put on the deck, making her even more top heavy when an ice storm struck in January of 1961, making her god awful top heavy and she toppled over during that storm. She had a skeleton crew on board of 28, 14 uh, enlisted men, uh, 14 civilians, all died. We also lost the Pinta on May 7th, 1963. She was rammed by the city of Perth. Not a lot of people knew exactly what happened because at that time, we didn't have an economic limit. We only, we only had a, a, an international limit of 12 miles and uh, the state limits were only about three miles. And because of the fact that both vessels were a foreign registry, we never did an investigation into why on a perfectly clear evening, one minute after sundown, on a clear night, that a vessel could strike another when they could easily see each other from miles away. But it was a beautiful little wreck to dive. When I first started diving it, she was largely intact even the rigging on her mast, masts were intact. Today, her bow is intact, her midsection is flattened out, and her stern section is clamshelled open right on that line of portholes. She, she's a shadow of herself. This picture is one of the most famous pictures ever taken off New Jersey. Here's a diver within a month of the, of the sinking of the Pinta at the actual stern in about 85 feet of water. When this picture goes public, divers realize, I don't have to go to Cancun. I don't have to go to Florida to dive shipwrecks. I can dive shipwrecks right here off New Jersey. And that started the wreck diving craze in New Jersey waters. And it's still strong even today. This is the tanker Stolt the Galley, which was sunk on Thanksgiving night by the Israeli liner Shalom in uh, 1964. The Shalom hit her right there. The bow half floated, the stern half sank. Now what's interesting to note is because the bow half floated, the company that owned this vessel lost another vessel where the stern floated and the bow sank. So they welded the two together, and up until recently, it was still in service, despite a five or six foot difference in the way. Ingenuity, right? Frugal, frugality. This is what lays on the bottom today, but at a very haphazard angle. This is coral in bloom, mussels, and starfish munching on the mussels. And these are sponges down here. Everything in that picture, other than the wreck itself, is an animal. No plants, they're all animals. We have very few plants that grow on our wrecks. It's mostly animals that encrust them. We also intentionally wreck vessels off our coast to increase the amount of substrate that sea life can attach to. 
sea life quickly attaches to any substrate on the bottom and becomes a reef, becomes a haven. Hydroids, coral in bloom, sponges, mussels, hydroids, sponges, oh, sorry, coral, sponges, hydroids, and fish, sea bass in particular. Critters. <coughs> I was assured by the photographer that they did not harass this animal after taking the picture, but you got to figure that's about one and a half, two pounder. <laughs> that would fit nicely in my pot. Small fish are attracted to uh, wrecks, and little fish attract bigger fish, and anything on the bottom for any amount of time becomes, becomes a reef, becomes a haven, and we love to dive on them. Fishermen love to fish around them. So this is now the most unusual thing that I've ever found, that I've ever dived on off New Jersey. This is one of two small locomotives. They predate the Civil War. I can't prove the incident that put them on the bottom yet, but I am working on it. But these predate the Civil War. They are Lilliput locomotives. Both of them side by side would easily fit into this area up front. We imagine that they are built somewhere between 1851 and 1854. The boiler is only about three feet across, and this diver is about three feet back from the front. So that gives you an idea of just how small these locomotives are. But they had a lot of brass on them, a lot of brass trim on their fenders, their valves, uh, any of the hardware on them, the banding that held the uh, outer uh, skin of the boiler onto the frame, all brass banded. These locomotives were meant to be seen. This is like the height of the Gilded Age, right? These locomotives were probably used as commuter type engines rather than something that would haul a freight. And that's the end of my presentation. I thank you very much. Okay. You have a question. Yes. Uh, one that I remember from being on the in the old papers is when Stockholm and the Andrea Doria had a, a little meeting for Oath the Port of New York. Uh, can you tell us anything about that? Well, I'm not an expert on the Andrea Doria, but I can I, I know of I know probably about as much as anybody that's done any reading on it. The one thing I can tell you that I think is really fascinating news is a couple of people that I'm familiar with, a couple of friends of mine, were recently diving in that area on another target in the Cape Cod area. And on the way home, they had uh, gotten a lead on a potential target near the Andreadoria. And when they dived on it, they found the bow of the Stockholm. When the Andrea Doria raced forward and the Stockholm rammed it, she snapped off her bow and floated off. When the Andrea Doria started to fill with water and drift, the bow fell out, and then finally the Doria sank. So now a missing piece of that disaster has now been found and identified. I think that's pretty cool news. Sir? Have you ever dived in the U boats that are off the shore? I've not dived a U boat yet. There is one U boat off New Jersey that I know of. It's a little deep for me. Uh, my comfort level in, in New Jersey waters is probably maxing out at about 140 feet. I don't have the equipment to bring me to a deeper depth. And at my age, I'm not about to start diving that deep. At one point when I was in my 20s and 30s, I did think about diving much deeper, but the opportunity never presented itself. I could never get together with the right buddies where we could go and, and pursue that passion of deep diving. Also, those deck guns were typically manned by naval personnel, and they were mounted on merchant ships for the sole purpose of trying to beat off a U-boat if they caught one on the surface. So. Exactly, exactly. Sir? Yeah, approximately how many U-boat sinkings took place in World War One and then in World War Two? I'm not yeah, sure about World, World War I, I yeah. but I, if I'm not mistaken, I want to say it's something like seven out of eight U-boats built were sunk. Yeah, tremendous amount were sunk, possibly uh, more than that. Not a lot of U-boats survived the war. 
when we finally figured out how to track these guys down, we were so good at getting them that the war, the Battle of the Atlantic turned on them, and they went from the, being the pursuers to quickly being the pursued. Yeah, approximately 75% of the U.S. personnel were killed. Yeah. Sir, again? Uh, we were transiting once between uh, Tonkin Gulf and, and Taiwan Straits, and all of a sudden we went to general quarters because we thought there was a submarine down there. And after a couple of hours of transiting or, or zinging and zagging, and we discovered, we figured out it was a pinnacle. And which we, it was done by sonar. Uh, the point of the question is, does sonar enter into your search for wrecks? I mentioned a little earlier that NJHVA doesn't necessarily look for wrecks. We look to identify wrecks whose locations are already known, but their identities are not. Now that doesn't mean that from time to time we don't actually try to look. We, uh, we actually did. We were successful finding a wreck using other, somebody else's data. I'm just going to use the screen just for general reference. We knew that offshore there was a vessel that was lost. Nobody knew where it was. But we did know that in the north was a wreck called the Francis Wright. We knew that inshore was a wreck called the Maurice Tracy. And we knew that offshore was a wreck called the Seaside Crane Barge. When we looked at fishermen hangs in the area where they were catching their nets, they were in these three positions, as we expected, and a collection of hangs in the middle. We asked a boat captain, what's this wreck? And he said it's called the Vivian. Now it's probably a nickname. When we dived it and did research, we were able to identify it as the Estelle Finney. Now, we didn't know of the existence of that wreck, but using remote sensing that other people had done, sonar, snagged fishing hooks, magnetometers, we were able to locate a wreck and then identify it. But by and large, the wrecks we identify, their locations are known, their identities are not. Well, Mr. Lee, Dan, as an old scuba diver, I can't tell you you've given me a most entertaining evening. I think every I speak for everyone here when I say we're all fascinated and we could probably stay until midnight. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Kind of awesome. National Maritime Historical Society. We want to thank Mr. Dan Lee. We do have an, um, our goodie bag for him. It will be delivered to him. It's waiting for him at the office, which is a great place for it. And we always have a little something of all our various memorabilia from the National Maritime Historical Society. Well, thank you. This has been a most fascinating evening. And as a member of the steering committee, speaker steering committee, I want to thank each and every one of you for having come here tonight, having taken your Wednesday night, and I hope this is the beginnings of many, many more successful in-person meetings. Thank you. Oh, you that's my other job. Great job, Mr. Which you should do, Spurge. Richie Green. So, okay, so we haven't done this for a couple of years, and we left the stanky bag in the office, but you know what? That's the biggest problem you have. <laughs> we will ship it to you. This was fabulous. Just one interesting uh, piece of information after another, and we are really grateful when you get Thank you so much. I have a question for you, and I'm, I'm always interested in feedback. This is probably one of the most varied programs I, I give because it touches on a lot of things. Did anybody feel that it was too long? No. no. Did anybody feel that, uh, that it had a good amount of content? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I do other shows too. <laughs> we love it.
<laughs> so, um, so I get to do what a little, some of the, I get to tell, first of all, we're going to do a raffle. Those of you who bought a raffle ticket, I'm going to draw the raffle prize. There are lots of goodies that the, we're just going to have one winner. And, but I also want to remind you of upcoming events. There are lots of these flyers, one for each of you to take with you to remind you, and, or you can fill it in here and we'll call you because there are not that many spaces. But we'll go, July 16th, we're going to New York City and we are going to take a luncheon cruise aboard the historic and wonderful fireboat John J. Harvey, which will probably put on a water show for us and take us on a great tour around in New York Harbor. So there's one of these for each of you. Uh, in September, our Chairman Emeritus and probably one of the most well-known of America's shipping experts, Clay Maitland is going to do a Zoom meeting for you. Uh, he does a Mondays with Maitland TV show every Monday, and this will be our conversations with Clay on Saturday, and you really will not want to miss that. Um, October, of course, is our big awards dinner, finally again at the New York Yacht Club. October 27th, and then in November, we have John Rocco talking about uh, Hollywood and the sea. And in uh, December, our good friend Tim McGrath, uh, who had won the first uh, uh, Navy League Commodore Barry Book Award, is coming with his new book on John Monroe and uh, President Mon Monroe's, um, uh, his, the influence that he had with America's Navy. And it's, it, I think it's a fascinating story and one of which most of us are not that familiar. And all things being equal, we will be able to do that once again over at the Cortland Yacht Club with our holiday brunch. So we invite you to that. Um, and uh, that is it for our uh, seminar for this year. We've got lots of things lined up for you next year, but you will not want to miss this cruise, this luncheon cruise on the John J. Harvey, but there are not that many places. So take one of these with you, sign up, let us know. Um, Lou, would you bring me the raffle basket? Sure. And Captain, would you draw the winning ticket? And the winner is mm -hmm. the winner is zero nine nine four two six. And we have a winner. No other announcements following that. Thank you so much. It's so, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to see everybody again. And uh, look forward to next time. Yeah. Need a ride, right? I need a ride. Okay. If anyone else needs a ride to the train station, let us know. Um, take one of these. <laughs> <laughs>